Welcome into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. Today, we're going to go back uh, and, and talk about one of those uh, the tried and true subjects of the American mafia and true crime in general, and something that uh, I've made myself an expert on, and I'm very honored and excited to bring on the expert on the subject matter. We're going to be talking Jimmy Hoffa, the state of the case. We're a week or two removed from the most recent uh, machination in the investigation uh, regarding a theory that his body was moved to Milwaukee. Dan and I will address it uh, briefly. Uh, Dan Moldea, I call him the godfather of Hoffa Research. He was here from day one at ground zero. Uh, I pay a debt to him because I wouldn't be able to do my reporting and research if it wasn't for his 35 plus years before I came on board. Thank you, Dan, for coming and joining us. Thank you, Scott. And you're fabulous. Let me tell you, you are, you. You, you are, you are the minutia expert on this case right now. I, I bow to you. Well, you know, I think Dan and I compliment each other. You know, Dan has the, has this story, you know, I, I think he, he said it before. And I'm going to, I'll throw it back to you, Dan, but Dan, I love how you've analogized it to like a Shakespearean and play with different acts <laughs> Because that's what it is, and I sort of, uh, I, sort of I sort of viewed as Ahab and, and his white whale. That's the kind of way. I well, he he is Dan is Captain Ahab going after his white Ahab. whale, so but just in terms of the the um, the narrative here, uh, I think the, the story comes in different acts, and um, Dan is again. I, I I'm not trying to belabor this, but uh, Dan is when you're going to the you're going to the source. This is the source. This is the. Uh, Dan was literally here uh, uh, from day one and uh, wrote the the first major book, uh, The Hoffa Wars, and uh, has had a acclaimed career since then. Uh, numerous New York Times bestsellers, big big time book projects. Um, but but Jimmy Hoffa is his baby, and I'd like to think that it's I've, I've taken a you know a little slice of the baby myself as something that I take a lot of personal pride. Yeah, in. You, right now, your viewers are listening to the two top experts on the Jimmy Hoffa murder case right now, and I'm, so, I'm glad we're doing this. I'm glad we're sort of giving an update as to what's going on. So we're just going to touch on this right off the bat. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but because uh, honestly, I, I don't give it a ton of credibility, um, if any. So the the Milwaukee theory emerged. Um, this fall uh, comes from a nonprofit independent cold case investigative unit uh, right. called the K uh, the Case Breakers. They've been on they've this been, for a couple. They've been on this for a few years. Actually. Yeah, and Dan and I had talked about this, uh, right. you know, personally uh, off air. Or, you know, uh, over the years, we knew that there was something that was percolating with this group. Tom, uh, I think it's. We call him Tom Colbert. It could be Tom Colbert. Uh, I think but it's he, Colbert. He, Tom Colbert. He's he's again. You know, he, I might not agree with this particular theory, but uh, he is somebody that has a resume, um, has a, a a career in investigative journalism that, yeah. to some acclaim, he had a series on the History Channel. Um, so, but so what, what, was that, what, what, what was he talking about? It was about D, about DB Cooper. The high, the hijack was, was it solved? Did the New York Times say solved? DB Cooper solved? <laughs> I don't think they ever did. Okay, well, okay, so it's still out there. Okay, right. So uh, his theory, I'm, I'm just going to put it into a, a nutshell, and then I'm going to throw it to Dan to get his comments on it. Um, his theory is that a former Chicago corrupt police officer by the name of Harold Walters, who was had some form of relationship with Joey Iupa, who was the Chicago mob Don of the 70s and 80s. Walters got kicked off the Chicago police force, and then they got kicked off the Oak Brook police force, uh, ends up moving to Wisconsin at some point in the 70s. He claims that he was involved in the kidnapping. Um, and then at some point, 20 years later, in September of 1995, he helped uh, move Hoffa's body from an undisclosed location to the former site of Milwaukee County Stadium where the Milwaukee Brewers played from the 
fifties, I think it, it about 2001 when that stadium was uh, torn down, they now played, I think it's called American family field, formerly Miller park, which is in the same, uh, you see the right next door, right across the street. And uh, while Wal- when Walters died in the spring of 97, he wrote on a ace of spades playing card. Uh, I don't know if you call it a map, but set, trying to send people to underneath the third baseline at County Stadium. He names Hoffley, he names Joe Ayupa. He gives it to his niece, who I guess was a member of law enforcement in Wisconsin. She sits on it for 20 plus years. When she retires, she hands it over to the case breakers. According to the case breakers, they've had three independent sources that confirmed this and they did some type of GPR um, technology that it, that signifies that there was some disturbance. And then there's some sort of a dog involved in this too, right? Yeah, cadaver, a cadaver dog uh, sniffs a body uh, or what they think could be a body underneath. You know, the one thing that we've done and we, we've adhered to is that there is a certain timeline and there, there is a certain cast of characters who's involved in the Hoffa case. And that's tried and true through the whole system, whether it's FBI wiretaps or whether it's the Hoffax report or whether it's intelligence from the various law enforcement, this is completely offbeat. Uh, this is so far out in left field where the cast of characters is it doesn't even resemble what we have been dealing with over the past 48 years. And so um, uh, what we have to do is we have to evaluate this on it i mean my position is is that colbert and his and his group have said here is a spot he's right here uh the third baseline of this field in milwaukee this baseball field in milwaukee my position is hey let the pros come in and do a gpr there and if there's something there dig it up and it, even if it's a even, even if the dog has detected a dead body there well, we may be able, they may be able to solve another crime, but it's not going to be Jimmy Hoffa. We know that it's not yeah. going to be Jimmy Hoffa. I, I would like a little bit if 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 I had my perfect scenario here and I wanted to give this theory uh, credibility, I would like to see a. I would like to hear where they took the body from. I mean, so you have twenty years of an unaccounted body in this theory. Two, I'd like to know. Tell us why they needed to move the body. Three, I would like to know uh, how Her- – just saying that Harold Walters says that he was involved in the kidnapping, <laughs> there, there's got to be more meat on that bone. Well, as I recall, I've seen some of the documents that they've had, and as I recall, they were essentially claiming that the body was originally up in, uh, in the Lake Huron region. Uh, or in the Upper Peninsula or something like that. And I remember that like about five or six days after Hoffa disappeared, I was with NBC News at the time. I had been working on Hoffa and the Teensers about eight months before Hoffa disappeared. And then I had helped John Quitney with a series that he had done with the Wall Street Journal that came out uh, July 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, 75. And then the following week, Hoffa disappears after John's three-part series on the Teamsters Pension Fund comes out. And then John called me and he and I went searching for Hoffa, failing to do so. He went back with his tail between his legs to New York. I came to Detroit and hitchhiked up to the Red Fox and was hired and met Irving R. Levine, who was hired by NBC News. So I had a source on day one who told me that there was a guy named Roland McMaster who had a goon squad. And they were running around shaking down trucking companies and, he, and that they were behind the local 299 violence off his local before before he disappeared. And that the, the, the these acts of violence, which preceded his disappearance right up until July 10th, 75, when Dick Fitzsimmons car was bombed uh, outside of uh, what's the name of that bar? Ne- Nemo's. Nemo's. Nemo's right by Tiger Stadium. Yep. And so they. And he also told me that McMaster was with some of his goons on Manitoulin Island up by Lake Huron. And so I said to my group, I told my bosses at NBC, I said, you know, I'm 25 years old at the time. And 
And I'm saying, you know, send me up there. I would like to do this. And they said, no, no, we're, we're going to. And then they sent up another reporter, a reporter with what, with a wife and children. And he went up and just as my source ex told me, you know, there were people populating this particular area. And so, and he made a decision not to go into the area. So he never found what was in there and he came back. But th th there's a bit, a lot of theories that something was going on up in the upper peninsula or Lake Huron and that the body was moved from there to this location in, I thought originally it was in Indi Indiana and now it's Milwaukee. Again, I, I, I'll let these people explain this for themselves. But I think he had the guts to say, here is a specific spot. And I think out of respect for that, that that spot should be examined. I mean, it's like it's not like Colbert is somebody who's claiming, you know, that, uh, you know, that the body was built, was buried in a, in a, in a, in a wall or something like that. You know, no, if there's enough evidence, he is being very specific about it. And I said out of respect for that yeah. and out of respect for his credentials, it should be examined. I agree with you 100 percent wholeheartedly. Um, I guess there's two things here. First, a lot of things here. Two things that are coming to my mind right now. Uh, first, I'd like to to say that or I'd like to tell the the uh, viewers and the audience just a little bit of history in, in case they've forgotten. Um, Roll McMaster is a, a a major character in the story of Jimmy Hoffa's rise and fall, right. uh, and. In the year, as Dan, I just want to color up some of what Dan said. Yeah. In, in, in the year leading up to Hoffa's disappearance, there was a kind of mini war within the Teamsters Union and within the mob going on between pro-Hoffa loyalists and anti-Hoffa uh, anti uh, goons. And, and Roll McMaster, who had once been Hoffa's number one muscle, uh, his the, right. the top Mr. Goon that, that there ever was, right. um, had abandoned Jimmy Hoffa and had and had become adversarial with him, had uh, aligned with the mafia who didn't want Hoffa back in the union. Uh, and that was after that was after Hoffa went to jail. It's wait, just... after Hoffa went to jail. And, then, and now what I'm saying is the year leading up to Hoffa's disappearance in July of '75, starting in 1974. There were there was a, a series, a continuing series of intimidation uh, attacks or intimidation tactics, um, attacks, uh, physical attacks, car bombings, boat bombings. Uh, against, and, against local 299 officials like Otto Wendell, George right. Roxborough, Ralph uh, Proctor, guys Dave, that were, Dave Johnson's Dave Johnson, guys that were backing Hoffa started to be. Um, forcefully and uh, begin to get muscled and, and being told if you stand with this guy, you, you can get hurt too. And, and there were Roland McMaster was known to have created or had gotten the okay to create a, a goon squad. That's entire purpose that on a day, the, that was on a day to day basis. At the 1971 teachers convention, there was, there was this innocuous, Memor uh, uh, resolution that was passed by the General Assembly of the Union creating this uh, special commodities uh, steel hauling type outfit uh, that was going to organize the unorganized and Roland McMaster was put, put in charge of it and it was it was a shakedown up I did a story for the Detroit Free Press with Joe Thomas and Ralph Orr in uh, in June 1976 about this and what i thought was after i left nbc the nbc offered me a job while i uh, when i was sent to new york and i said you know i think i'm on this off case and i'm gonna i think i can solve this this is in 19 this is in like august 1975 and i said and i and i focused on uh and so i went back home left nbc went back home and i i didn't have a source in the fbi I had other sources, but not in the FBI. And so I wrote up a 15-page memo saying, this is what I think happened to Jimmy Hoffa. And it was completely about Roland McMaster and his goon squad. I thought that they were the center of the universe at that point, because I believe that whoever was behind the local 299 violence was going to be behind the murder as well. So there was just 20 days after right. Dick Fitzgerald's car was bombed. 
just 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 so people understand, there was a a day to day campaign of violence being launched by McMaster's and his people. But nobody knew who to, it to was. try to 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 try to dissuade Hoffa from running in the seventy six election, right. and from his uh his loyalists to up uh, trying to get him trying to get the loyalists to abandon Hoffa and alienate and isolate. Like, McMaster was never, never targeted, or he was never publicly accused of being behind the local 299 violence. I had, uh, there are, there's, the FBI did three, F, when I sent my 15-page theory to the FBI, they came and visited me. They did three or four uh, 302s on me, and they had suspected that two guys who worked for McMaster and Larry McHenry and Jim Shaw were behind the bombing of Dick Fitzsimmons' car on uh, on July 10th, 1975, 20 days before Hoffa disappeared. And I was told that a guy named Jim Robinson was responsible, who was another McMaster goon, was responsible for uh, the bombing of Dick Fitzsimmons, uh, excuse me, uh, Dave Johnson's cabin cruiser. In Grozeal. Excuse me? It was in Grozeal. That's where he right. was bombed. Exactly right, and 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 that I was also interested in obviously the 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 shooting of George Roxborough. I spent some time with George and talked to him and knocked his eye out. And uh, he was lucky he was still alive. Otto Wendell, uh, you know the things that happened to him. I think his barn was uh, burned down or something like that. There were, as you say, it was almost a daily grind of things that were going on, and people were blaming. This individual who was a sort of a freelance uh, Hoffa hater named Coulter. And that was the person they were blamed. They were not fingering McMaster until I made a big deal about it with my theory. And then they came and visited me and I re and I gave them the information about the goon squad. And I thought right up until December of 1975 that this whole thing was a McMaster operation. And I was at the Free Press at the time doing a one project, a project on Hoffa and his, excuse me, McMaster and his goon squad. And on December 3rd, we got information that uh, people were going, five people were going to appear before the grand jury, the federal grand jury the following day on December 4th, and that these were the people who were involved in Hoffa's murder. And it came out on the third, the night before, that the four guys were Tommy Andretta, Stevie Andretta, Sal Bergoglio, and Gabriel. The Tony Pro guys from New Jersey. The Tony Pro guys from New Jersey. Tony Pro, of course, being one of the three people Hoffa was supposed to meet at the Red Fox on July 30th, along with Tony Jackaloni and and your buddy Lenny Schultz. Lenny Schultz. Right. Okay. And so, um, and so. Uh, I was clinically depressed because I figured, well, McMaster's not even in this game. And I was sitting at my desk in the Free Press newsroom, and John Opendahl, who was city editor at the time, came up and he said, take one guess who the fifth guy at the grand jury is. I was down the stairs like a shot, ran across the street, went up to the grand jury where the grand jury was, and Roland McMaster was there. And I got in his face. And, um, and he, we, we had been McMaster and I had been talking over the phone. This is the first time I'd met him. And then remember how it was. It was a guy named Ralph Picardo who had put these guys together. And Ralph Picardo said that Hoffa had been murdered in Detroit, stuffed into a 55 gallon drum, loaded onto a gateway transportation truck and shipped to New Jersey. And Ralph, but just so people know, Ralph Picardo was a driver uh, for Tony Pro. Uh, Anthony Provenzano, who was a capo in the Genovese crime family, ran their New Jersey uh, operations, all their labor union uh, operations. And Picardo was pro's driver. So Picardo was probably yeah. the first. Pro, pro's rival? No, he was with pro. He was with pro. He no, was... I'm saying he was Tony pro's driver. Okay. Chauffeur. I thought you, I thought, oh, oh, I thought you said rival. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Dri driver. His chauffeur. He used to drive Tony pro around. And so what had happened was, I think it was like about five or six days after Hoffa disappeared. Uh, Picardo, who had been convicted of manslaughter, was doing 20 years at Trenton State Penitentiary in New Jersey, received a prison visitation from Steve Andretta, one of the four alleged conspirators, co-conspirators in the Hoffa case. And this is like five or six days after the murder. And allegedly, uh, Tommy Andretta had come along with him with, with their accountant. They had some business deals they were doing together. 
And when Steve Andretta supposedly was alone with Picardo, he gave to them the basic details of Hoffa's murder, that Hoffa was killed in Detroit, stuffed into a 55-gallon drum, loaded onto a gateway transportation truck, and shipped to New Jersey. When the FBI, when he flipped in November of 1975, Bob Garrity from the Detroit field office of the FBI questioned him. No, but it, well, he, he wasn't said, just from the field office. Bob Garrity was the uh, the head of the Hoffa task force. Right, it was, exactly. it was right. his case for five years or six years before he transferred to Pittsburgh. And I know to this very day, this eats at him. Bob uh, has trouble sleeping at night in the 2020s because of the case that he investigated almost. It, it, that's yeah, how got, personal That's how personal this is with some of these guys. You know, I, I've got some emails from him, and you're exactly right. Yeah. And so – and so the FBI and Bob Garrity and the FBI said, do you know who killed him? And he said, well, Steve didn't tell me that, but I know that Sal Bergoglio had a contract given to him by Tony Provenzano. And I don't know exactly what happened with that. And they said, did he tell you where they took him in New Jersey? And he said, no. But when I, when I was with the Provenzano crew, we would bury people at Brother Moscato's dump, which was in Jersey City. So the FBI did a, uh, a cursory search of Brother Moscato's dump in Jersey City, this toxic waste stuff, which was filled with quicksand, wild dogs, and, and rats. And they, they didn't have a specific place to look in this 39, 40-acre uh, area. And so what could they do? There was nothing they could do, so they dropped it. And essentially, Brother Moscato's dump was dormant. I interviewed the Bergulios and the Andrettas in October of 1976, uh, I asked them what they thought about Brother Moscato. They they slapped it away. Dan, let me let me just interrupt yeah. you for one second because I'm fascinated by the fact that the Bergulios and the Andrettas agreed to sit down with you for not just an interview but for a tape interview. You taped it, three and a half hours. So do you, do you get a feeling for what their uh, what, what 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 do they feel like they could gain from it? I mean, I guess getting their story out. Well, what happened was what happened was is. Um, I was in New Jersey. Uh, Rolling Stone had asked me to do a pull together for the one year anniversary of the grand jury. And so it was the late summer, early fall of 76. And I was putting my research together. And so I decided to call Sal Bergoglio at 560, at local 560 in New Jersey. And so you know, I got through to him. He got on the phone and I said, uh, who are you? And I said, I'm Dan Dam, a reporter. I was also working with Jack Anderson at the time, the, the syndicated columnist. And I, I put the Jack Anderson uh, uh, credit up first because I didn't know how he was going to react to Rolling Stone. And so I uh, so with Jack Anderson, I said and Jack Anderson was viewed as a civil right, civil rights, civil libertarian guy. And so uh, I said, he said, what do you want to talk to me about? And I said, well, Mr. Gill, I want to talk to you about the Hoffa murder. And he says, what do you, th you know, why do you, th do you think, why do you think I have something to know? Why do you think I know something about that? And I said, because Mr. Gullio, you've neither been arrested or indicted. And I think the government is violating your civil rights. Now, I've never met a mafia guy who's not against wiretapping. I've never met a mafia guy who's not in favor of strong personal privacy laws. And I've been bored for hours like you have, Scott, listening to what mafia guys whine about the alleged impingements upon their rights and freedoms by yeah. the FBI and the IRS. And so, uh, so Bergoglio said, come on up. So I went up to 50, Life 50, Life 560 by myself, and I, um, I was in the waiting room. And then Bergoglio comes in with his lawyer, Bill Buffalino. Who's who, from Detroit. Who's who, from Detroit. Go ahead. Who, who I want to just uh, – I, I, Dan, I think you know this, but I guess it's possible maybe you don't, so I'd like to get your comment on it, whether you know it or not. Bill Buffalino, who was portrayed – in the movie The Irishman, which is like we can go, we can go over, do five hours on that, but we're not going to. But in the right. movie The Irishman, Ray Romano plays right. Bill Buffalino, and he's and portrayed. Did a great job. Yeah, but it, yes, but he's portrayed as uh, as as somewhat meek. And, <laughs> yeah, I, Bill and Buffalino I, was not a meek. And guy. I want to say, not only was Bill Buffalino not meek, no, if you believe right. the FBI, Bill Buffalino wasn't just an attorney or an in-house counsel 
for the Detroit Mafia. He was a made member of the Detroit Mafia. I never knew that, but uh, he, he he told me that I was a- asking about Russell Buffalino. They during the interview they kept on talking. About, Russell Buffalino was not on my radar screen when I interviewed the Regulios and the Andretas, mm-hmm. and it was it was Bill Buffalino who kept on bringing. It was the interview itself was when Buffalino says, "You want to join us for lunch," and I said, "Sure." So we went down to the to the garage. And we and we got into Bergoglio's car. Bergoglio was driving. Bill was in the front seat, and I was in the back seat. And I was I was uncomfortable, was to say the least. But we just drove across. We drove across the street to a restaurant, got out of the car, went to the back, and there was Gabe Bergoglio. There was Gabe Bergoglio, and Steve Andretta. It was Gabe Bergoglio and Steve Andretta. And so, I I interviewed those guys not on tape, uh, during the lunch. But then Gabe had to peel off, and then um, Bill Buffalino, Gabe Bergu- uh, uh, Sal Bergulio, uh Steve Andretta, and I went up to Sammy Provenzato's office. That's Tony's was, brother. Tony's brother. And I, I forget whether he was, a, I think he was some sort of officer in the local at the time, and we were in the president's office, Tony Pro's one-time office. And it was there that we did the three and a half hour interview. And then Steve put me on the phone with Tommy before the interview ended. And I was able to talk to Tommy as well. And so, yeah, that was a fun time. But all of that was kind of forgotten. And then in 2006, there was the FBI's search warrant. McMaster, McMaster's uh, day. McMaster's that, was the, that was when I made my bones. <laughs> it got into the Hoffa case. It was the first dig that I covered. Um, that was that was righteous. I mean, the FBI, as far as I'm concerned, has done nothing but righteous work on this case. I think they've been really excellent. I got a few complaints with the way they've handled my thing, but they've been righteous on this thing. And any any problems there have been have, have been problems of omission and certainly not commission. The FBI wants to solve this case badly. I'm sure yeah. this is a feather in their cap. And uh, I want to do everything. And I'm sure you want to do everything to help them do that. Uh, and so the so McMaster's farm was targeted, and Don Wells was the was the key guy, and he was the person who lived at the farm with McMaster. And I knew Don back in in 1975. I interviewed Don. I spent uh, I spent some time with him back then. And then when I interviewed him in August of 2009, after three years after the the search, he told and they me spent, what, and just for people that. Uh, Go ahead. Don't remember it. That 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 was probably their mo. Uh, the FBI when they dug up what was known as the Hidden Dreams Ranch, uh, right, right. At, at the border of Commerce Township and Milford, uh, in Metro Detroit, um, Wix, Wixom, Michigan. Right. Yeah. Well, it's like three cities coming together. Milford, Wixom, and Commerce Township are all kind of in that at that intersection. But um, it was probably the uh, longest most expensive dig that the feds have ever done. They were there for 10 days. Because they had uh, to tear down the barn. and Millions and, of and dollars were put into that dig. Uh, what happened was when, when, when I talked to Don Wells, uh, I, went, I, was, I was there early in the morning. I think it was uh, August 9th, 2009. And I said, and they had put together a, this, this, this composite this collage of photographs of what the farm looked like in July, 1975. And there were all these pictures of what it looked like. And I said, let's go, let's go down there. So we grabbed the, I grabbed the, the poster board that they put together for me. We drove down to, what was it? Hidden dreams. It was Hidden called, dreams. called Hidden dreams ranch. Yeah. Which, which was like, it was right off uh, Pontiac trail, right off Pontiac trail. And I remember we went in and the farmhouse where they lived was almost, it was completely dilapidated and, and almost, it looked like something out of uh, Dresden. And then when you went uh, the dirt road back, there was this big wall. So it had been uh, perimetered and had, had been pieced off and parts of the property had been sold. So we went around to the front of the house on the other, because what, what, what I wanted to know was Don Wells said that there was a there was a 
a, a, a hole that McMaster had dug uh, 40, 40 yards to the um, to the south east of uh, uh, the intersection between a dirt road and railroad track. The bottom line is, <laughs> without getting into the bush, the bi bottom line is, is that the FBI, instead of going to the north southeast, they went to the southwest. They dug in the wrong place. And it was based on a, a, this, this, this horrible map that, that Don had drawn while he was in prison. What was crazy was instead of taking him out of prison and down in Lexington, Kentucky, and bringing him up to Milford Township to actually supervise and oversee the, the dig so he could say, here's what's here. They, they went by this, this, this horrible map that he had drawn. And the conclusion was they dug in the wrong place. They, they didn't need to. I was there and I paced off the, the 40 yards and it was an empty pasture. The barn, the big barn was over here. And um, uh, so but the big news that Don had was that the night before the murder, the night before Hoffa was murdered, he was at was at um, uh, Carl's shop house, Carl's shop house, which was with, uh, with Rolla McMaster and Stan Barr. Go ahead, explain Carl's shop. So Carl's shop house was a, a, a favorite haunt of the Detroit mob. Uh, it is literally across the street from what is now the Motor City Casino um, in the old Wonder Bread building. But across from the Wonder Bread building was Carl's Chop House. And I know Tony Giacalone, who we haven't mentioned in the first half hour of this. Uh, Tony did, that he was meeting with Hoffa. Go oh, ahead. right. Sorry. You're right. We, met, we uh, So Tony Giacalone, who uh, you know was probably the one of the quarterbacks, if not the quarterback of this whole conspiracy, uh, can sit, you know, died in 2001 as a, you know, one of the top suspects, if not the top suspect in the case. Uh, Carl's Chop House was his favorite restaurant. So well, Tony spent a lot of time. Night before, on the night before Hoffa's yeah. murder, Don is there with, he's having dinner with Roland McMaster and McMaster's brother-in-law, Stan Barr. Barr. And Stan Barr, and uh, Stan Barr was the head of Gateway's Gateway Transportation, Transportation. Field Division. Yeah. And so while they were having dinner, Tony Provenzano at Carl's Shop House in Detroit, the night before the murder, comes up to them and says, it's going to be a great day tomorrow. It's going to be a great day. Uh, he says, Mac, you got a minute? You know, I want to see it the, privately at the bar. And so Mac gets up and walks away. And Don says to um, uh, Bar, he says, What's tomorrow? And he says, oh, you know, Provenzano and Hoffa are meeting and, you know, they're going to try to bury the hatchet. So McMaster comes back to the table with Provenzano and Provenzano points to Stan and to McMaster. And he says, you two guys know where you're going to be tomorrow, right? And McMaster says, uh, yeah, we're all straight on that. And where they were that day was they were at a meeting with gateway officials. And at least for part of the day, it's still unclear where McMaster was at exactly 2.30, 3, 3 o'clock that afternoon. And um, and I believed that I believe that uh, that Hoffa had been had been. I believe the FBI was correct when they said that Hoffa's body was at McMaster's farm uh, uh, on that on that day. And they said the FBI said there was no evidence that it had ever. Uh, been moved, and so as a consequence of that, that was something that I, that I sort of felt that I would embrace. But the, but the situation was one in which I was investigating a crooked judge down in Florida, and he was getting payoffs from mafia guys, and the mafia guy who was his principal payoff guy was a guy named Philip Moscato, and so I said to my partner David Corn, who I was writing the story with who's a reporter here in Washington, an old friend of mine. And I and I said, I know who this guy is. He's from the Hoffa case. So he says, what do you want to do? I said, I'm going to call him. So I called Moscato up and I said, you know, I, I want to talk to I want to talk. He said, yeah, come on up, come on up. So I go up to his, I drive up to his home in Brick, New Jersey. And nice fellow. He's a, he's a, he's a soldier. Yeah, he was a, Provenzano, as you pointed out, was a, is a capo in the Genovese crime family. Moscato was a soldier, so he was in the Provenzano sphere of influence there. And he was a huge loan shark. He controlled all the loan sharking in uh, Bergen County, Hudson County. And he was the one who owned Moscato's dump in, in Jersey City that Picardo had referred to, which is where Hoffa was. And so I 
was having my conversation with with Moscato about the on tape uh, about the um, about the crooked judge, which he he admitted making payoffs to him. And then he and then I said, you know, the first time I heard about you was during the Hoffa case. And he said, you wrote that book about Hoffa, right? And I said, yeah, 1978. And he said, uh, I said, so tell me what happened. And he told me that Hoffa's body was at his dump. Told me the body was at the dump. And I was stunned by that. And it was almost like he had um, what, 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 what's, what's the what's the phrase when you, you just said something you wish you hadn't said it. He had that look on his face. But I had this thing memorialized. And then when you guys were investigating uh, Joe Zarelli, um, not Joe Zarelli, but Tony Zarelli's claim that yeah. that that Hoffa had been buried in that Oakland township, um, Oakland County. Um, 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 the, the Toco, it was the old Toco farm. The old Toco farm, right. Yeah. And when that was going on, and I called Moscato and I said, what do you think of what's going on in Detroit right now? And his response was, Dan, I think I already told you what happened. And so that was fascinating. And I kept I kept on. I, I stayed loyal to Moscato for seven years from 2007 to 2014 when he died in February of 2014. And he during that period of time, he gave me information with the frequency that a kosher butcher sells pork chops. But he did give me. He said that that Hoffa was picked up by Vito Giacalone. He didn't tell me where he was taken, but he said that Muscat, that that Sal Bergoglio was the killer and that Hoffa's body was stuffed into a 55 gallon drum, taken to New Jersey. And he said that it was buried in his stuff. He said Picardo basically had it right. That's what he told me. And so years later, I run into um, I meet Frank Coppola, who's father, Paul Coppola, was the partner of, of Phil Moscato at the dump. And he tells me the story about how Moscato had given his father the assignment to bury Hoffa. And that and that Frank Coppola on September 29, 19, 2019, took me to that area, which I filmed with about two or three cameras on, uh, showing me this alcove under the Pulaski sky where he said Hoffa's body was. And <laughs> that's where I've been lingering ever since. Let, let's um unpack this a little bit more in terms of sure. um thank you for letting me get all that out I, no I no it's good no it's good it's good context uh mcmaster and the goon squad attacked a couple of hoffa loyalists that have an end and a demise similar to hoffa like uh I, well, I, I have five murders that I call uh, Hoffa fallout murders that uh, took place between 1976 and 1984. Um, you have Ralph Proctor. You have Otto Wendell, which are two names that, that you mentioned. Um, right. Otto Wendell was shot uh, in on December, December of 77. 77 okay 77 and then uh proctor's killed in august of 84 what, what was that viewed as an accidental shoot he had a gun in his no that was a murder and i believe i believe that both of these murders like i said they had tangential connections to hoffa i spent i i interviewed both of them but i spent some time with otto I, and um i um okay go ahead well, and this this is what I'm getting. This is what I'm getting at. Go ahead. Uh, I would like to interject a name uh, into our conversation that gets glossed over. Um, I, I think. Go ahead. I know who you're going to say. Go ahead. When we're talking about the Hoffa case, but I think he plays a, a big role in not just the Hoffa case, but then in some of these fallout murders, and that's Vince Maley. Oh, uh, Vince Maley. Okay. Um, and. Uh, little Vince Maley was the nephew of the longtime Detroit mob underboss, Angelo Maley. And little Vince was a powerhouse. This is a guy that um, served in World War II, uh, got uh, numerous Purple Hearts, was in what is now considered the, the um, uh, not the SEALs, but the, the Delta Force, like the the elite of the elite. He was 
General MacArthur's driver. This is a guy that could have I, been, I did not, I did this guy know. could have been anything in the world, but he came back to Detroit after the war and became a mob guy, a very successful businessman. But what did he control? He, uh, a number of businesses, but one of the major industries he controlled was the steel hauling industry. Steel hauling business, right. Uh, which which he was close to who? Which brings him close to McMaster's. And, and, who, did, and who did Roland McMaster have breakfast with? The day after right. the murder, Vince right, Vince Maley, and Vince Maley um, was someone that had helped him and his dad and his uncle had helped put Jimmy Hoffa into power. They were um, Angelo Maley, right? Angelo Maley, who was little Vince's uncle, and his dad Frank Maley, who they called the Music Man um, because uh, Frank controlled all of the um, jukeboxes and and uh, uh, entertainment um, wing I guess of the of the Detroit Mafia and Maley is accused uh, or I shouldn't say accused is suspected of having a role in both Otto Wendell's murder wow. and Anthony or sorry and Ralph Proctor's murder again I, I call the I've never heard that. Yeah, uh, I it call would it, make sense. It would make sense. It yes. Make sense. So, Maley uh, accused Wendell um, of testifying in a grand jury that sent Maley to prison. Right. Um, he's killed, like you said, in, in late '77. It's made to look like a suicide, which is a staple of Detroit mob murders over the years. They. They Don, often, Don Wells told me that, and one of the reasons why Don Wells flipped was because he didn't want he he knew that McMaster was involved in Ralph Proctor's murder, which he just and he did not yeah. want that to help him. It, it happened to him. Go right. ahead. So so Wendell's murder is veiled as a suicide. Uh, uh, initially, they the investigators claim it's a homicide. Maley was always a top suspect. Um, Carlo Licata. Uh, ends up dead on the anniversary of the Hoffa case, July 30th, 1981, at a residence that I suspect very likely could have been the place where they killed Hoffa. Um, Carl Licata's, uh was a mafia prince. His dad was the godfather of Los Angeles. And then he married into the Detroit family and was brother-in-laws uh, with the Topo brothers, who Jack Topo was the acting boss of the Detroit mob at the time Hoffa disappeared. Um, and his death is still officially ruled a suicide. Um, there's a lot of FBI agents that uh, believe that he was murdered. His The gun that killed him uh, was found about 20 feet away from him with no prints. Um, and he shot allegedly shot himself in the chest. Uh, so these are kind of like following along similar lines. And then, and then Proctor is in 1984, Proctor ends up dead um, a couple days after he has a altercation with Roland McMasters. Right. Uh, Proctor had left the Teamsters and had started his, um, his own union. Uh, he had loaned the Teamsters a hundred thousand dollars. He's trying to get that money back was being unsuccessful oh, in getting oh, was unsuccessful in getting the money back and then started threatening McMasters and Maley. Well wow. uh Go ahead. and he ends up he ends up uh murdered uh, in August of 84 and he's going to a meeting with Vince Maley's son-in-law Anthony Lapiana who if you are someone who's going to adhere to what the FBI believes is the underboss of the Detroit Mafia right now. Uh, Jack Toko's protege and nephew via marriage. Uh, Proctor tells his wife, I'm going to meet Tony LaPiana at the Chinese restaurant uh, up the street. And he's found dead uh, in that parking lot. So, and then there was another, so that's, uh, that's three. There was another one of a, an attorney that ended up dead in 76 in New York. And then I'm, I'm blanking on another one, but what, what, what's, uh, do you, yeah. To me, to me, this when when the day I got hired by NBC in in seventy five August third or fourth seventy five, uh, 
And uh, Irving Erlevine and his crew said, why don't you come with us to do interviews? The first place we went was Lenny Schultz's house. So that and, you brought you, so just, that, you brought so us that, back to- The one thing that I have totally embraced in this case is where Scott Bernstein is, is, has interviewed, and I'll let you tell the story in your own words, but yeah. interviews this guy who is very close to Lenny, who was very close to Lenny Schultz, and tells him an amazing story, which you shared with me, and I yeah. have completely embraced as being true. Go ahead. Tell the story. So you brought, I'm glad you, you reeled me in. This is where I was going. So from real, uh, from Vince Maley and Roland McMaster, um, who were, you know, I, I would call sleeper characters in this story. Everybody hears about Tony Pro and Tony Jack and the Bergulios, but there are, you know, sleeper characters, guys that are lesser known, but could be very well equally as important. Well, so, Bailey, me, yeah. Lenny Schultz is the third guy Hoffa was supposed to meet that. Day. Yes. And he, remember, he on his pad, he had Tony Pro, Tony, Tony Jack, Lenny and, and in my book, in the Hoffa Wars, which came out in 1978, I eliminated Lenny Schultz from the discussion uh, because Lenny Schultz had made it very clear he was going to sue anybody. He sued Eddie. He sued everybody. He didn't sue. Uh, he didn't sue me because I I left him out until we had better information. But after your story, to me, he is back in the game again. He he was and very litigious. The information that you have, which I completely and totally embrace. Go ahead. He's very litigious. So this brings us to Lenny Schultz. Okay, so um, Lenny Schultz is kind of the forgotten member of that would-be lunch party. Uh, for people that don't know who Lenny Schultz was, was a old-time Jewish racketeer in Detroit, very close to the Jackaloni brothers, was Tony Jack's uh, liaison in the labor unions. He owned a labor uh, consulting firm. He was tied into the old Purple Gang uh, which was the Jewish mafia. Uh, as a young boy, he, he was an Aaron, an Aaron boy for the original Purple Gang guys, and then gravitated uh, towards the Italians. So I came upon a source. Also, also Joshua Dorr. Remember Joshua Dorr? Well, so that, I'm going to get to that in a second. So I came upon a source. Um, this must have been in 19 or 20, 2019 or 2020. Um, who was someone that I had um, gotten information before from, and it, it had been accurate, uh, had never spoken about Hoffa. He approached me one day and wanted to uh, talk to me. And he proceeds to tell me, he he's a guy, he's still alive. He, he I'm not going to get more specific than that, other than he was uh, a one-time, he was, he was one-time muscle for Lenny. Um, he was a, a guy that would sometimes drive Lenny around, bodyguard Lenny, and and uh, disperse beatings in uh, on, on union ran construction sites if they needed to be done. Um, this guy told me that Lenny Schultz confided in him that Hoffa was killed at Lenny's house, which you know I, I, at first I subscribed to the. Lakata theory. Uh, Lakata's house is about five minutes from the Red Fox restaurant where where um, Hoffa was last seen. Lenny Schultz is about three or four minutes. Lenny Schultz's house is about three or four minutes in the opposite direction from that location. Schultz was supposed to be at that meeting. He helped arrange the sit down. He was very close to Jimmy Hoffa. Hoffa and Schultz went back all the way to the um, you know, back to the 1940s together and had worked very closely together. And Dan mentioned it to me, this is, this is, is kind of like a, uh, a litmus test or a, um, a deciding factor in, in, in the opinion of someone that would give this credibility. Dan mentioned the Joshua door furniture chain and Joshua door was a very famous um, trendy furniture store in Detroit owned by a, a Jewish businessman named Harvey Leach, who had been introduced to the Jackalonis by Lenny Schultz. And a year before Hoffa was murdered in 1974, Harvey Leach was murdered after a dispute with the Jackalonis 
and according to the FBI, was murdered at Lenny Schultz's house. So if the, the theory that um, I would not have a problem getting behind would be if the Detroit mob felt comfortable killing someone in Lenny's house in 1974, it, it, it it's not a huge jump to think that they would feel comfortable killing someone there in 1975, especially with the proximity to where Hoffa was kidnapped, the trust that he had towards Lenny Schultz. Um, and then this, that, this right. source Detroit. tells that's me it. that they turned the body over to Roland McMaster. And the, yeah. and the trip from, from Schultz's house to the Hidden Dreams Ranch would be pretty much a straight shot. Uh, you would, uh, Lenny Schultz was at 13 in Franklin. You'd have to divert about two miles to 15 mile road. But if you take 15 mile road um, to Pontiac Trail, you dead end it to Hidden Dreams. So it, it'd be a really uh, easy, easy route to take. No, I had when I was doing the Moscato's dump thing in the Jersey alcove. The I had been contacted by the FBI, and they wanted my cooperation. And I'm 73 years old, and so this is use it or lose it time, as far as I'm concerned. I wanted to cooperate fully, and so that was in September of uh, 2020 when they first contacted me. I was 70 years old then. So then. Um, the FBI asked me to come to a meeting in Newark, New Jersey at the field office, the FBI field office. And the Detroit field office, a lot of guys from, and, and the U.S. attorney, the temporary U.S. attorney from, from, um, from Michigan uh, came to the meeting along with the, so it was a meeting of the Detroit field office and the Newark field office. And with a lot of superstars there in the room and and it was for the sole purpose of listening to me put this together. And so I put the whole thing together and they said, where do you think he was killed? And I said, there's this great reporter who's the world's expert on the Detroit mafia named Scott Bernstein. And they knew who you were. All the Detroit people, of course, knew who you were. And I said, that's what I believe. I believe that Hoffa was murdered at Lenny Schultz's house, that they turned the body over the Roland McMaster Roland McMaster, they took the body to Hidden Dreams Farm. That's where they that's where the 50, that's where the gateway truck was. They put him in a 55 gallon drum, loaded onto the gateway transportation truck, and then shipped him to New Jersey. Now, when I wrote the Hoffa Wars, I had a problem in that I believed what Ralph Ricardo was saying. Hoffa was murdered in Detroit, stuffed into a 55 gallon drum, loaded onto a gateway transportation truck. But it made no sense to me, Scott, that they were going to transport this guy 600 miles away. It made no sense. You know, the Stan Barr was the head of the steel division at Gateway Transportation, which was right next door to the Ford River Rouge plant, where they crush and smelt tons of steel every day. And I met this mafia guy named Chuck Cromaldi, who was in the Woodstock program from Chicago. And Cromaldi told me that specifically that Hoffa was crushed and smelted. And, and so instead of going all the way in my book in 78, instead of going all the way with Picardo, I said that Hoffa was, um, I went with Picardo that he was killed in Detroit, stuffed into a 55 gallon drum, loaded onto a gateway transportation truck, but then I have him going, being disposed of, being crushed and smelted right there in Dearborn. And so, um, but it wasn't until Moscato said to me, it, it's at my dump. And then Frank tells me what his father said and shows me the location. That's when I started to embrace the final part of Picardo's story. And once again, Moscato said he basically had it right. That Picardo had it right. So, so Dan, I want to ask you a question and also pontificate something that I, I feel. With both Lenny Schultz and Carl Licata, you have two houses that, if it's not one, it's the other. To me, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's, if it's not one, it's the other. It's one of those two houses. Why hasn't the FBI gone to either, unless they've done it without my knowledge, gone to either one of those houses, who, by the way, I can, I'm not going to give the names of the owners, but I can tell you that the owners of both of those houses 
would welcome with open arms an FBI uh, crime scene unit or uh, they're they're the type of people that embrace the po potential history in their house. I think, uh, I think it's that it comes down to what we were talking about the other day when we were talking about Milwaukee and it's getting probable cause to get the search warrant to do this. I mean, they're going to have to. What I'm saying is you don't. What I'm saying is you don't need a search warrant. That's the point I'm making. Oh, because you, you can said, knock on the door at Lakata's house or knock on the door at Lenny Schultz's house, and they would let you in and do whatever they. So, and then added to this, I want to throw this out at you. Um, my source on the Lenny Schultz thing, and this is a lot more difficult to prove, but this, my source on the Lenny Schultz thing said not only was Hoffa's, uh, not only was Hoffa murdered at Lenny Schultz's house, but that the murder weapon is in the backyard, is today, currently, is in the backyard, and that Schultz's backyard in the 1970s was a murder weapon graveyard, quote unquote. That, in fact, when we interviewed Lenny Schultz, it was there in his backyard. And yeah. and if you go to his uh, property or his the old property that well, it's still it's an it's an existing residence. Um, Schultz hasn't lived in it in 40, 50 years. But if you go to the property and you talk to the neighbors, which I have, and you go in the back. For whatever reason, and the, the <laughs> speculation can go wild in someone's head, he was pouring concrete back there on an almost like monthly basis. And it's this pretty big, expansive uh, uh, acreage on, on the back of the house. And there every 50 yards or so, there's like a, a random patch of concrete. Uh, and do, I, do a, uh, Scott, do a GPR there. If the people are, are willing, yeah. to do a GPR. And, and uh, see well, I've been up. looking for someone to finance that privately. I've got a couple people that are, might be interested. I, I just don't understand why the feds wouldn't be jumping at the opportunity to at least try to lock down one aspect of it. They, they did it with the uh, crazy Frank Sheeran theory. They went to the house on Beaverland in uh, Northwest Detroit and did a DNA. Oh, actually, that was, I should say, that wasn't the feds. That was actually, I think, state was police county. Oakland yeah. County. But well, whoever it is, I, I right. would like to see them go to Schultz or Lakata's house and do some type of DNA scrub, uh, get in the backyard, look. And, but if you, if you did find a weapon, since we don't have a body, you would have to somehow find Hoffa's DNA on the weapon, I guess. So I got to ask you this. So, yeah. This we're talking about. Tell me about Tony Powell. So then that's another, so another sleeper figure in this whole thing. And I, I've come to believe my, my theory is that the hit team consisted of Billy Jackaloni, Sal Bergulio, and Tony Palazzolo. And I will respectfully disagree with uh, Mr. I'm sorry, uh, could you discuss, repeat those three names again? Where, where were they? Uh, the three people that I believe kidnapped and killed Jimmy Hoffa were Billy Jackaloni, Vito Jackaloni, you know, a.k.a. Billy Jackaloni. Which is what Pascado said he was driving the car. He right. Me, Salvatore Bergoglio, who was Tony Pro's guy, and right. Tony Palazzolo. And I said, I'll, I'll respectfully disagree with Mr. Moscato and say that I believe Pal was driving the car. Billy Jack was in the front passenger seat. Sal Bergoglio was in the back passenger seat with Hoffa. And I believe now what the FBI has come to believe that Palazzolo was the killer. But I do believe Bergoglio and uh, Billy Jackaloni were present as representatives uh, for their respective capos, uh, Tony Pro and and uh, and Tony Jack. So so Tony Powell was a um, at that time he was a young soldier uh, that, according to the theories that have emerged over the last. 10, 20 years, uh, used his participation in the Hoffa homicide as leverage to propel himself up the, the ladder in organized crime circles. He, he was uh, rewarded, for what my sources tell me, he was rewarded with uh, being given control over Canada for his, wow. for his initial participation. Um, in the early 80s, late 70s, he was given... Um, control over Detroit's Canadian affairs. Was by, he related to the Tacos or the uh, Zarellis? Or no, but he was very close. Uh, his family uh, dated back to Sicily. Uh, a lot of wise guys in his family, his father, his brother. Um, 
he came up under under a guy named Pete Vital, Pete Vitale. They called well, him Bozzi. Partner was Jimmy Quasarano, who right were the owners of Central Sanitation. Yeah, so uh, Pete Vitale uh, was the uh, godfather of Greek Town in Detroit, which right. uh, it's, to this day is still like the main nightlife district. Um, and and well, I remember Greek Town. Yeah, Bozzi Vitale was a downriver guy, which is a, a very specific part of Detroit. Um, kind of south southwest um, a cluster of kind of factory towns, and um, Pal was a downriver guy and was mentored by Pete Vitale. Was also very close to the Jackalones and the Tocos. Uh, eventually became a capo, and then became consigliere before he died in 2019. He was caught on a wire in the early 90s, bragging of of participating in, in Hoffa's murder and, and killing Hoffa. I, I think what solidified with the federal government, his role in it um, came from Tony Zerilli, who it, it, named it, him as the killer, even though they didn't find the body where Zerilli told him to go look. At my command performance in New Jersey at the, um, at the FBI field office, which was the Detroit field office and the New Jersey field office, the Newark field office working together. After the after my lecture, I felt like a Vegas lounge act walking around the room explaining things. And after the lecture, we went down to Moscato's Dump. We all got in cars and went down to Moscato's Dump. And while I was there, I talked to the head of the FBI investigation in Detroit, Mark Silsky, who was there. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, Mark, there's a rumor out here that you guys have a wiretap of Tony Powell confessing to the murder in no uncertain terms. And he looked at me, smiled knowingly. And he said, no comment. That's what he said. Well, so when, when I was, I was you told. Might on, you might be on to something here because you said that it, it, uh, it, Jack Loney's brother and Sal Bergulio and who was the third guy? Pal, which to oh, me, Tony Pal it's... and Hoff. I just wonder would would Hoffa have gotten in the car with Tony Pal? Yeah, I mean, I think... he had been dealing with with the Jackalones in order to set up the meeting, and they had been coming out to the to his home and uh, out at the lake. But would, would he have trusted the Sal Bergulio? I knew Sal, Sal told me that he knew Hoffa very well. And interestingly, on December 3rd, 1975, when we were getting these names about these guys who were going to appear before the grand jury, I had been working. I, I'm a reporter who takes sides, as you know, and I aligned myself when I first got into this thing with the rank and file reform movement of the Teamsters Union. I was working with the Teamsters United Rank and File, the Teamsters for a Democratic Union. I was working with the Professional Drivers Council on Safety Health, the rank and file reform organization trying to rid them of the union of the mafia. And what we were trying to do was, in, in, this, in this effort to, to, to take sides, we were trying to figure out how we could do this without causing problems to the FBI's own investigation. And uh, because we, you know, it, it's, it was interesting back then, as a young reporter, like I, was, like I said, I was 25 in 1975 when Hoffa disappeared, and I was on this from day one. I said, uh, FBI guys, they would, they weren't, they weren't saying, here's what happened, and tell me everything. But they would say, what do you know? And then I would say, this is what I know. And they would say, okay, well, stay on that gateway track, but get off that uh, Coulter thing. Yeah. You know, they would make sure that I stayed on track. These days, <laughs> It is just one way it's just street. Stonewall. It yeah. is they want to they want to juice you for information, but they don't want to give it like said, you know, it's not a two-way street. I was yeah. more than happy to give it to them. Yeah. I had I had I had created a web page for them that I put online where I, I it was protected. It was photographs, film, right. timelines, documents, and everything. I wanted them to have I gave them everything I had. The one thing that I wanted was to be there when they did this damn search, when they got their search warrant, where the judge said probable cause existed, yep. off was there in that alcove. 
and they did not invite me to that denouement, and they ended up not digging in the one place that well, they did it in the dark. They did it in the dark. It's the first dark Hoffa search they've ever done. I still don't completely understand what the um, the, the the method of the madness is behind that. Uh, I personally, I know Dan took it personally. I took it personally. I had been um, informed by some sources of mine within the investigation um, that uh, we were going to be able to be present. The, the, those sources told me that they were told by their superiors to lie to me. Um, I know that some of my reporting when it comes to Hoffa uh, has upset prosecutors because they feel like there are leaks. And I know when the new prosecutor took over, there was some type of meeting basically saying nobody talked to Scott Bernstein. Um, but, you know, I, I'm just trying to push to push the needle and, and find some closure here. Uh, I feel like we've gotten so far, you know, people like Dan and I, uh, the, the investigators themselves, um, historians, guys like Jack Goldsmith, I feel like we're we're literally on the goal line. Um, we've had trouble punching it in uh, for the touchdown. I, yeah, I'd like yeah. I'd like I'd like to see something before the 50 year anniversary, well, which is here, coming up in two years. Here, we, here, my problem was this: I had found out about the. I knew when they had done their first search in October of 2021. I knew about that right away, and I knew what they had what they had basically found with their scans and what they had not found. I had an eyewitness there. In fact, two. I had two eyewitnesses there when it happened. Um, and June of 2022, when they did the big thing, and the first week of June 2022, in fact, you just told me something. I did not know this was under the darkness. I was at this spot at 10, 11 o'clock at night, and it is one spooky area, let me tell mm -hmm. you. And so I... I found out a month later. I found out on July 1st. I yeah, was, we all did. I found. I out. almost got sued. The History Channel wanted to sue me. They felt like I was in breach of a contract because I told them I was going to be a, able to be at the dig. Well, I call. I called up my. There's. What happened was, I always stayed loyal to this one FBI agent in Newark. I never went over his head. I never went around him. But he was a mid-level guy who had no decision-making power. But he was a guy who brought me to the prom, and so that's the guy I was going to go home with. He was a good guy, but he couldn't make final decisions, and and I think that's where everything. In my case, what happened was I had a team of people. We were working together, and we had a split on our team. And I was trying to. I was in the middle of the split, and this part of my team was working with the Newark office and my source um, at uh, at the Newark field office. Uh, my mid-level source with no decision-making. But the other part of my group was working with Detroit. And what happened was when I found out on July 1st, what had happened was there was a friend of mine from Boston who does a PBS show out there. And he was interviewing a guy who knows what he's talking about. And the guy, and my friend said, uh, what do you think about Dan's theory about uh, New Jersey? And he said, oh, that's over. The FBI searched and they found nothing. And my friend called me up and told me this. And so the alarm bells are obviously going off. So I called my, my source in Newark and I said, hey, what is this? And he said, yeah, you know, let's talk on Tuesday. I said, no, right now we talk now. What is going on? And um because I felt foolish. I was turning in reports over the past month to the FBI about things. And here they already knew what had happened and they weren't telling me anything. Anyway, we had given them this one spot where our GPR companies had found barrels. And I said, did you go to that spot? And they said, yeah, yeah, we dug that up. And so I called one of my friends in New Jersey, in Jersey City. And I said, do me a favor, go down to the site, take a camera, I want to see what they did, and I want specifically the site that we gave them, the spot that we gave them, where that where our GPR people found the barrels. And so he went down there. He, you could see where they chewed up everything, where the, all the digging was in the excavations. And then when he goes to the spot that we gave them on a silver platter, it was pristine, let alone an excavator. He didn't even stick a shovel in this area. 
And so I called him back and I said, hey, you guys didn't do anything there. It is completely pristine. I've got the film right here. He said, okay, let me turn this over to Detroit. So he turns it over to Detroit and Detroit was kind enough to do a Zoom call with me where I was, out, I was allowed to ask questions and they would give me whatever answers they could give me. It was the most open time we had during the entire thing. And they admitted that they did not have, that did not do that spot. And so I've been saying to them, you know, listen, it, it, you know, our GPR team, it's not like we got to fly them in from California. They're right there in New Jersey. They're 20 minutes away. You guys in, your, in, the, in the field office, you're 10 minutes away from Moscato. You guys could do this at lunchtime. Let's get this over with. And for whatever, I know the FBI's they're busy guys now and everything else. And, and like I said, I don't think anything nefarious has happened. I think this was a, a miscommunication between the Detroit office and the, um, and the Newark office. But I got to tell you, I'm, I believe that Ralph Picardo told the FBI the truth in 1975. I believe that Phil Moscato told me the truth when he said Picardo basically had it right, that the body was at his dump, and that Frank Coppola's father told him the truth when he said he buried Hoffa at the instruction of, of, of Phil Moscato, and that Frank Coppola told me the truth when he took me down to the site on September 29, 2019, and showed me on camera where Hoffa's body had been buried in that alcove. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on in between all of this, a lot of drama and everything else. But that's basically where we are right now. And I'm sort of sitting here lost in space because, you know, this what I had been what I put my entire career on basically was that this was there. Uh, I, I'm sitting here and still waiting like Ahab for the white whale. Did they give a reason? They said we, why we didn't dig there? We, we think, again, this is pure theory because we're not getting anything out of these guys. But we think that there was a miscommunication between Detroit about what they had been told by part of my team, the GPR people, and what wound up with New Jersey. My, my guy in New Jersey, he may have been a mid-level guy without, without, um, without much power, but he was motivated and he, was, he, was, he wanted this to happen. And I know Mark Silski. In, in Detroit, the head of the FBI, the, the Hoff investigation. He's an honest guy, mm -hmm. and he was motivated, and he wanted this to happen. And um, I knew that I was uh, when, at the meeting in March of 2021 when I met with the, the joint Detroit FBI field offices. I, I sort of wanted to see who was kind of in charge, and I brought as a present my three and a half hours of interviews with with Hoffa's alleged killers, the Bergulios and the Adredas, because all the FBI ever got, or the U.S. Attorney's Office, mm -hmm. or the Strike Force ever got out of these guys was the fifth. So uh, I gave the three and a half hours of tapes to my guy in New Jersey, and I watched him to see who he gave the tapes to. He gave them to Mark Silski in Detroit. So I knew who was running this operation. Well, and that was the same guy who, who said no comment when I asked him whether he had Tony Powell on tape, so I, you you might be right on that, and if if you're right on that, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm wrong, because you said that you said that Sal Bergulio was in there. I as believe well. that Sal Bergulio and Billy Jackaloni, just like Moscato said, were a part of that hit team. I believe that the reason Hoffa got into the car was because he saw Billy Jackaloni and Sal Bergulio. Um, I so do believe. Bottom, so, so the bottom line is, and for me, is that is that Jimmy Hoffa gets into a car driven by. Vito Giacalone. They go to Lenny Schultz's house where he's killed by Sal Bergoglio. I'm perfectly willing to accept that, that, uh, that Tony Powell is there. They then take Hoffa and they deliver him to Rolla McMaster at Hidden Dreams where he's loaded onto a gateway transportation truck, shipped to New Jersey. He's already in New Jersey. But while it's, still, it's not even known that Hoffa's missing by the time he's in Jersey. And I'll tell you two things. One, it was that Tony Provenzano, from what I understand, wanted the body in New Jersey. He wanted access to it. And number two, I was told that there was an attempt to plea bargain for Hoffa's body. And I was not told this by some mob guy. I was told this by an FBI agent, that there was an attempt to plea bargain for Hoffa's body at the dump. And um, was, uh, that related, was that related to Provenzano's murder case? 
I didn't, I, he didn't tell me exactly what it was really to. I, when I approached him, I said, listen, you know, Phil Moscato has told me that the body's at the dump. He said, Gardo basically had it right. And so congratulations, FBI. You guys have been right all this time. And, um, and, and that's, as far as I'm concerned, I'm willing to give the FBI all the credit on this thing because I'm piggybacking on the Ralph Picardo story that the FBI developed back in 1975. All I want is a generous assist for everything I've done since, for me and my team. And so uh, that's kind of what we're in the middle of right now. And so, you know, nonetheless, there have been other things and other players in this thing. Fox News, there's uh, <laughs> there's this whole thing between me and Fox News. I, I will say that there was good faith with the GPR thing that they had done. The GPR tur turned out to be nothing, uh, but it was a good faith operation, um, whether it's, you know, whether it's Eric spending 18 years embracing the Frank Sheeran story or three or four years embracing the, the Moscato uh, dump story or whatever he's on to now, uh, he's doing it in good faith and I respect him for that. Well, Dan, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, go, Scott, thank go you right, for the for walk down memory lane. Thank straight you. to the source. Like I said, that's what we do here at the OG podcast. Dan is the source. Uh, it's been here since day one, ground zero. And uh, I, again, I tip my hat to Dan because all my research, uh, you're talking about piggybacking. I mean, <laughs> I, I didn't know anything about Jimmy Hoffa until I consumed Dan's uh, reporting. He taught me about Jimmy Hoffa before I even met Dan himself, his, his reporting and his writing did. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I always want to pay it forward. And I consider Dan a mentor of mine and a close friend. And I have nothing but uh, the, the, the largest amount of respect when it comes to this profession Dan is the gold standard. He really is. Cause he's, I, I like to uh, tout my versatility. That's something that I'm proud of. And I, that and Dan's versatility inspired my versatility. Cause right, Dan is like, someone who can like write about football. That you probably read my book on football. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get to that in a second, but Dan, thank you um, so much. We're going to do this again. I'm sure. Uh, well, probably I'm sooner than done. later. I, I know you're not. Uh, I'm yeah. not. <laughs> well, thank you, Dan. Uh, so this is uh for, for OG Pod, for Ben Behind the Glass, uh, we will see you next week. Out.